My presence at WITS affirmed very many things that I believe so passionately. And I want to talk about them very briefly without keeping you. But actually my stay at Adam Edwards reassured me of my notions of humanity. And it, it assured me of the importance of humaneness and of living within all those wonderful notions of Ubuntu and humanism that has dominated the world except in isolated parts. And in fact, the third thing is that the young people always affirmed my revolutionary band. There's no point being young if you do not have a <coughs> radical and a deep sense of change. What's the point? When you're young, you must want to remake the world, to rearrange circumstances. And in fact, absent that radicalism, many institutions will stagnate. So in many ways, Adam, it was an affirmation of my own life when I saw the students going totally radical. And yet, I knew that it was also a moment. Remember the many times I said to them, very angry, you can be radical and still be respectful. You can be radical and still be thoughtful. And so, every time I saw them, and every time I continue to see them, it, my trust in humanity increases. I want to say just a few things, a few valedictory remarks as, as, as I leave. Besides the gratitude of being here for 12 years, and leave being, being so reasonably well regarded, here is what I want to say. Before I do, I remember fondly they'll walk up to me and call me Comrade Chancellor. I don't know if they ever called you Comrade VC, but they would call me Comrade Chancellor. And they somehow were comfortable that I lived in the zone that they lived in and sometimes missed the difference between me and them. And here are some of the things I would like to leave with us, with me. The first is we must guard verts. We must protect verts. Verts, I've said to some of the students, is one of the gains of our struggle. It's one of the spoils of the war of freedom. It is not the spoiler, it is one of those things that you emerge with after a long struggle. So you've got to put verts into use. If it needs some repurposing, by all means, let's repurpose it. If you got rid of some names, by all means, let's do that. If you want to decolonize some aspects of our offerings, we damn have to do that. Because we're duty-bound by history, actually, to re-articulate our understanding of, of a good society. And this must stand in the center of all that. Don't tell me I did that again, Sese. <clears throat> but, and therefore the first thing and, uh, I want to leave you with is, let's guard this place. Let's have a choir like this. Let's have institutions that work and produce wonderful people, that strive for ratings, that have research output, that strive for excellence all the time. You see, Adam, Human history has never been linear. And notions of human goodness, chairperson, have never been ever present. Just think for a moment about the dark ages. When the horrible basically submerged all of Europe into horrific destruction and very barbaric notions of what we are and what claims we may make as human beings, not so long ago, First and Second World War, you can't match that barbarism, that utter atrocity and hatred that came and that served and flowed from one set of human beings to another. 
So, we have to continue to believe something that Robert Sobukwe taught me when I was a child. There's one race, the human race. We are one people who look slightly different for all number of very sensible and rational reasons. But at the core of all of us, we are human beings. And if we, if we lose that, young activists play around with fire as they invoke racism. We happily leave that to Hitler. Let's leave that to Trump. Let's leave that in, to Jacob Zuma in his horrible moments when he wants to fall back on ethnicity. There are horrible people out there. The current president of Brazil, the past leader of Venezuela. So there are monsters out there who think there's some fundamental difference in human beings. That is utter rubbish. And we, who have fought long, tireless struggles, we must reaffirm the beauty of my granddaughter, but reaffirm the beauty of all granddaughters of the world, wherever they might, with their origins and extractions might be. We must stand ready to embrace Islam and Hinduism on the other side and embrace Christianity to embrace nothing. All those are legitimate choices. And the sexual orientations we make, other decisions we make about just anything, Quite often, there are legitimate choices that we ought to fight for. The second spin about institutions I wanted to talk about was, we went to sleep for 10 years, and institutions were hollowed out. We went, we went into a slumber. We all lost the gas to tell a bumbling fool who was sitting out there acting as a president and tell him he's a fool and tell him he's incapable of doing the high ideals of our liberation struggle. And as we failed to do that, we actually allowed so much devastation and poor people became poorer. And a few people who had who are more adept at stealing, appear to be important. And we hear it rolling out every day before my esteemed colleague, Justice Zondo. And we must ask, how did we get there? It's abandoning our duty to make sure that we have institutions, but more importantly, that they are accountable, that they are properly populated, and that we would be the ones to scream at the height of our voices when that doesn't happen. The third point I want to make is that democracy is not <coughs> an absolute bar to despotism. In fact, democracies are producing despots now in our time. Trump thinks women are worth nothing he is basically homophobic. He thinks black people don't deserve to live. He thinks nobody should be migrating to anywhere in the world. And he thinks, in fact, truth is relative and is not steadfast, and he can create a post-truth world. And we should resist that. We who are true revolutionaries should refuse to be sucked into a world as mad as that. And had we done that and done it all together and bold enough, we'd be having institutions and a country that works. And now we have to promise poor people that they'll get proper latrines in Limpopo only in 2027. So a few babies must drop in there and drown, I think, before we get there. So what am I saying? It's a very simple message that says, as we guard our humanity, we have to guard institutions, and we have to find the courage to say it like it is. We failed for 10 years, and, and look what we brought to ourselves. Debt levels that are unimaginable. 
you can't even begin to, to think about them, and you want to match them with assets. I don't see the assets, all the money you've been collecting. <clears throat> At SARS, I, I can't always match assets with the money. It must have gone to buy all sorts of stupid things. So, WITS is valuable. WITS must be preserved. We must continue to produce those bright-eyed young people. We must throw them into each other in their wide diversity. We must reject outright fascism and narrow nationalism and continue to embrace our broadest humanity. And that's what Pan-African is about. That's what humanism is about. It's a deep recognition of the otherness, at the same time a deep recognition and embrace of yourself. And that together makes us to be what we ought to be. And lastly, I would like to wish our world well, Adam. And we have to trust that we can get it there. And the little revolutionary that sits in me, I trust that there'll be good women and men who will rise and who will muster the courage to be able to, to live in a way that actually enhances the life of the poor. And it works best when we do it who are the least vulnerable. But we must be the first to recognize vulnerability and those things that will destroy good societies. So remember, my parting word, and before I do, I have many friends who have come here. I'd like to thank you for being here. Friendship is another gift, something many people don't know. I have many steadfast, loyal friends, Adam. So when I get out of all the fancy and formalities, I have family, I have friends, and it works for me in a magical, in a magical way. I would like to stop now, and I think I have done whatever I had to do here. But even better, the place looked better. I said to the registrar, give me statistics. In the 12 years, what has changed at Wurz? And she rolled them out and sent them to me. Wurz is now a truly African university. It reflects the demographics of this country. In its leadership, we see that reflection of demographics again. It happened over the 12 years and longer, way longer. But in fact, in the I was measuring the 12 years and insisted on the statistics and I was given the statistics. <clears throat> My sadness about the statistics, I'm delighted women are by far a majority over men. So we're going to have rulers who are sensible, who are humanely, who are motherly, who know what it is to get human beings to get to where they ought to be and to hell with the men. So there are more and more women who are going to lead us. And when I look at the statistics again, Vice Chancellor, Chairman, it was clear that we've done a lot in administrative staff. The numbers look much better than they did and they, keep, they kept on growing. Research output, wonderful. It has been moving on. Number of PhDs, both on staff and PhDs uh, <clears throat> that we have produced. These have steadily risen. And that's important in a continent that is bereft of knowledge creation. So I'm excited about that. But it is so that it's predominantly white South Africans who teach at verse. And it's a matter that we have to confront. So you have predominantly a formation where you have, you need to go and attract young, young black people to come and become producers of knowledge. And that is the antithesis of the fashion. Look for patronage. Look for quick money from somewhere. If it's not around, steal it. Suck up, 
to bosses, listen to party line. All the things that get you up quickly is what we have taught our young people. And they have to unlearn that. If you want to be an academic, it's a slow brew process. If you want to be a good judge, it took me. I've been there for 42 years. Hell, that's my wife. 42 years as a lawyer. That's how long it takes to rise to the top. And those messages we have to keep on repeating. Why don't we have a plethora of young black academics at our universities? It's because we have subverted the natural formations in society, natural accretion and development. And all those most incompetent are sitting at the top and sitting next to the trough and hardworking people. I walked into one of the lectures I have as an honorary professor at a law school, which I won't name, and I say, mention to me four great lawyers you know. Or four great legal academics. Dololo. Okay, tell me of at least two nuclear physics <clears throat> academics who are black. Dololo. Tell me of NRF professors distinguished who are doing, who's Professor Philip Tobias? Dololo. So we've moved into a, 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 an uncomfortable zone that says, Power matters and it's everything. That says quick wealth matters and it's all that matters. And that if you're going to have some racial renting and it's going to get you up the ladder, it is fine. We have to resist all of those mad things. And I'm not saying it only because my nephew is, is shortly engaged with this lovely young lady. Um, I've been... <laughs> non-racial all my life in all my permutations. But the point is, we have to continue demanding and finding ways to excavate our humanity and making that available to ourselves, to our families, our communities, and to the world at large. And refuse to back down to Putin or to Trump or to Zuma or to any of those or president of Brazil we should just simply resist doing that. But thank you for the opportunity for serving you. Thank you ever so much, and God bless. Amen.